Yeah, I've been thinking this. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, second file status journey part of this semester. That's going to be given by uh, Professor Michael Ellert. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it is a very busy time of the semester, and the Friday afternoon and the very end of the semester, I know that the students are still uh, preparing your final exam and final project and so on. Appreciate your time coming here to uh, join us for this very important, uh, exciting <laughs> event. So I uh, look at Mike's CV and because I want to prepare some open remarks, I found that Mike and I got our bachelor degree in the same year, 1985. Yes. So I confidently <laughs> impute his age and actually very similar to mine, I suppose. And so we are sort of 35 uh, years that sort of, uh, you know, service and, and so, Hosted this undergraduate education. <laughs> so, um, Mike and I serve as an inaugural uh, associate professor during 2018 and 2021. Um, through this very close sort of working relationship, I know Mike a lot better. And in my eyes, Mike is a classical scholar and ideal colleague to work with. And sometimes I ask myself why you and Boston is, is so attractive, attractive to me uh, working here in the past 15 years. Uh, one of the reasons that I have such wonderful colleagues who can make the department a very warm, welcoming place to work. And certainly I like to thank Mike for his contribution to the department in many aspects. I look forward to knowing more about his journey uh, most of which will be found with our department. So without further ado, I would uh, be very uh, pleased to ask my colleague, Walter Dempsey, to introduce Professor Mike. Thank you. Nice things about Mike, so I will do that now. Um, so I had four things I wrote down. So, so my goal with this introduction is to say four things I already know about Mike, slash want to know more about Mike. So that's what I'm hoping to hear a little bit more about. So the first thing is when I was a postdoc, actually Mike and Mike's students emailed me a question about a paper I wrote. And so that was the first time anyone had ever asked me about something I wrote. So that was really, I was like shocked. I was like, wait, someone wants to know why, what my opinion on something is. So that was a great experience. Um, Mike and I uh, had lunch and I found out that he, I guess in 1985, graduated from the University of Chicago where I also went. Um, sort of my sister and brother. And if you know you Chicago, the, the motto is where fun goes to die. Um, uh, but I will say every person you meet who's graduated from you Chicago, well, not every person, a large portion of them are quite jovial and happy. And I don't know if it's because we've ex escaped from you Chicago or if it's because we all are just that way. Now. Uh, and so I don't know about the confounding relationship, but I'm just uh, excited to hear what he has to say about you Chicago back in the 80s. Um, and then the last two, uh, well, I know uh, I arrived and I have an affiliation with SRC. Um, and I've lucked out to have a few people sort of pave that path of being sort of joined in biostatistics and having a position at SRC. Um, and I'm just excited to hear how that has panned out in terms of earlier and how that looked. For me, it's been pretty seamless because people have done it before. So I don't have, have, any, as, have, has, have had as many issues. Um, and then the last one is, I know he worked with Rod, and I'd be curious to hear uh, what he has to say about his time in er his early career working with Rod in the department. I know at least now the department is quite a, a happy place, as Peter said, and it's a good place to, to grow a, 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 as a junior faculty. And I think it speaks to U of M that they brought Mike back and maybe it was against uh, Rod's better judgment and <laughs> maybe, maybe Rod had different opinions, but I'm really happy to hear and that what that would do, uh, Mike Elliott. Thank you, Peter Mulford, I really appreciate that. So, so yeah, I, uh, this is a uh, great fun. I'm honored to be part of the group of people who are sort of talking about our journeys to where we are in our career and our lives. And um, yeah, so mine was a little convoluted, which I think, you know, I guess if there's anything to take out of this is that, uh, you know, if, if your path isn't exactly straight, then maybe get a little bit of reassurance that, you know, maybe it'll, it'll still be. So, um, 
right? So this map is sort of where a little bit when I was a kid, I was born in St. Louis. You see the little the little dude there. Uh, then uh, we moved to Los Angeles when I was three. You see classic, maybe you can't see it very well, but it's a classic American shot. I'm at a bicycle with a gun in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we didn't stay there too long. Uh, when I was uh, four years old, we moved back to Cincinnati, Ohio. And then when I was 11, we moved up to Bluffton, Indiana. So uh, just a little bit of my background here. Let's see if this works. work. <laughs> Something will work. There we go. <laughs> so, um, my parents, um, my mom uh, from a farm in Indiana, which you'll see by some pictures a little bit later on. Uh, her dad was a farmer, and back before then, going back to the early 1800s, they first settled in the area. And my dad, uh, his, uh, his father was a grocer, and his mother was a seamstress, actually, um, uh, did, uh, did sort of medical courses. They both passed away now, mom just last year. Um, pictures from their high school days. Um, so first of all, my mom, um, she was a really, a, I think, a pretty amazing person. Everybody thinks about their mom, but I, I think in this case, I have some external evidence as well. <laughs> uh, she, was, uh, she was one of six women out of over 100 chemistry majors. They go to the university, she got a full scholarship there. Uh, for, for somebody who didn't have any college background, it's not a, a family that had had a lot of educated background. Um, then uh, after she uh, she graduated, she worked at the Mallon Park Chemical in St. Louis, uh, which had a contract with the Atomic Energy Commission. So uh, this was uh, uh, some of the things were kind of really out of like almost men in black. Imagine <laughs> guys in sunglasses showing up at night to to meet my mom and take her to the airport. Uh, basically, sort of flights to what turned out to either be Hanford, Washington, or Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where a lot of the development of atomic energy and weaponry was going on in the 1950s. So, um, so props to my dad, who was didn't blink an eye that his wife was going off to some place in the middle of the night. Remember, this is the 1950s. So it's a little different time. Um, but uh, she did uh, she did stop working after I was born, although she returned. And sort of had a very different career, um, eventually running a library and leading the construction of a, of a multi million dollar um, um, uh, state of the art library in a rural county. So, this is a, a county where farmers are uh, not big fans of taxes, aren't necessarily people that put a lot of stock in, in, in high education. Uh, so, it's really the first library to build out of, out of the tax pockets. And so, it's really pretty impressive that she pulled this together. I mean, it really is. Quite a nice library, I think, especially for its size. It's a really fabulous children's room. It's filled there. See that uh, she got some awards in that in the area. More generally, she was just a tornado of hard work and energy. You know, every every evening was basically a second second shift of volunteer work for her. She did a lot of work with the Indiana Library Association both before and after she retired. Um, <clears throat> I was in the band. She did a lot of work with that, which included exciting trips through places like Michigan in July, sleeping uh, on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on um, uh, gym floors, which, uh, you know, we were teenagers, so we didn't really care. We were we being asleep. But I think for somebody <laughs> as a parent, it would be a little different, but they she stuck with it anyway. Actually served on the school board and did a lot of, done a lot of work with the historical society down there. It's a master garden. It's the library. That she was in, that was involved in. So my dad, I would characterize him as very honest and hardworking. Uh, strong beliefs kind of had a dark sense of humor. You see, this is uh, he was raised in the city. He spent his summers on his grandmother's farm, and it's one of his pictures from you know, I think middle or early high school days. And here he is, that was he. So he did serve in World War II. You saw a picture there. He fought with an engineering unit across France and Belgium from basically the end of October to the end of the war, amongst other things, liberated some death camps. Um, then after the War was in uh, a firefighter in France where he, I once asked him about that, he said a perfect record. Everything they uh, caught on fire burned to the ground because they had no water. <laughs> so perhaps the dark sense of humor came from those kinds of experiences. Um, he also gave, unfortunately, I would say, uh, a raging case of untreated PTSD. 
Uh, so, you know, whereas hell kids, you really should avoid it if you can. Um, but um, anyway, after the war, we came back. Um, we had been doing some school, engineering school beforehand, but but uh, eventually majored in chemistry at Indiana University, where I met my mom, uh, worked in the pharmaceutical industry, did a lot of stuff with over the counter medications. So it was kind of interesting. In some ways, he was almost like a candy maker. He did a lot of work <laughs> trying to get the right balance. It's, it's actually kind of interesting because if you're if children's medicine back in those days was very difficult to administer because it is very, very bad. As an adult, you might be able to sort of tough to it, realizing it's supposed to help you. But as a you know small child, that can be really, really difficult. So they tried to do flavorings that made it palatable, but not really tasty, because you also didn't want kids poisoning themselves. So that, that balance was, was often tricky. And we worked hard on that. Um, so in the mid seventies, he kind of left for a lower key life in rural Indiana after my grandmother passed away and they came into possession of the farm. He worked for an insulation maker and then later on a high tech, high, high tech seal and valve maker, made valves for uh, aircraft in the space shuttle, not the valve that blew up. 1986, point <laughs> out, their valves worked. <laughs> but, uh, but he also, uh, you know, he worked hard. He'd often be out four or five in the morning on the job, but then he'd come home, you know, pretty like mid afternoon, and that was kind of it. So he loved the outdoors, very much into fishing and hunting. I had an opportunity when he retired to take him to a, to a, um, a fishing camp in northern Maine for a week. There we are, relaxing, pretending to fish off the uh, Porch. <laughs> um, so I would say he was an introvert to my mom's extrovert, sort of the work life balance versus the grind culture, maybe if you will. Uh, very traditional guy, like I said, you know, really in hunting and fishing, but he also was very modern. I think he um, he was he uh, his his uh, his mom uh, ran a small business, was fairly independent uh, in her own way, and um, he knew how to cook, which may seem strange to say this now, but that was a rare thing in the 1940s for men. With his background. And so again in the army, he did things like cook meals, which was shocking, made him very popular. <laughs> he was way around around the kitchen. So um, okay. So I moved to Cincinnati when I was five years old. Um, uh, it's uh, I kind of spent the first half of my childhood in, in the suburbs just outside of uh, Ohio. It's a pretty typical, I'd say middle upper class uh, suburban life. Uh, yeah, Joe's and Speed Racer cartoons, Cub Scouts, 40. Uh, one thing I do remember is kind of cool about it. It was kind of, it was a very heavily developed. It was a sort of the early 70s, so urbanization of America is underway. And um, I spent a lot of time kind of wandering the fields and local construction sites right around our house. It was really a great place to be a budding geologist. Um, so if you've been to Southwest Ohio, it was a shallow ocean about 450 million years ago. I guess the Orbicani. I can't remember, can't pronounce it as an earlier name. But anyway, I actually still have some of the fossils I collected from, from those days. So um, I really love science and math. Um, maybe not shocking given where you know. Um, but um, it's uh, my parents did encourage that. Uh, they had books on astronomy, a telescope for my 11th birthday. I actually ended up building a telescope when I was uh, in high school. I remember uh, so I still kind of have some interest in that area. But they didn't really push me either. I, I think um, the only thing they really worked on was spelling. I was and still am a terrible speller. <laughs> uh, but there was no spell check in 1972, so I kind of forced on my own. It was also, I think, a pretty interesting school district. It was kind of split between sort of well-off, not so well-off, black and white. Uh, this was, uh, remember, the civil rights era had just gotten underway. So there was a lot of segregation. There were some actually some, uh, you know, black and blacks were allowed to buy in a lot of areas that whites were. And um, so there were sort of upper class, upper middle class black areas, lower, lower middle class black areas, upper class white areas, lower class white areas. All these were kind of sort of rubbing shoulders and, and desegregation, very high quality schools, a lot of enrichment opportunities. I remember learning a little bit about Fortran in fourth grade. <laughs> they still use punch cards. Anybody knows their history from those days. <laughs> so you then had a, a major change in life. Um, in, uh, in sixth grade, I moved to Bluffton, Indiana. 
to a family farm outside the small town. You can see the, the picture there. It's somewhat looking somewhat bleak on a day like today. Um, my dad was kind of uh, downshifting his career, I would, that's one way to put it. And my mom went back to work in a new career as a librarian. It's a much smaller school, it had some pluses and minuses. Um, I would say it was even more socially integrated, but certainly not racially, so it was all white. But it's a small town, so you kind of rub your shoulders and elbows with everybody. Um, to say it's a minus, it was, um, it was a, uh, uh, education was a lower priority. Example of that is only about three quarters of my initial uh, freshman high school class even graduated and a small fraction of those folks went on to a four year college. Uh, it was also a place to be kind of isolated physically and socially. Although with, with time, uh, I think I kind of overcame that. Uh, one of the things I did was try to, again, only child, boredom is an issue. Um, reading math textbooks and kind of doing problems was kind of a funny thing I did. And it kind of allowed me to kind of um, stay ahead of the curriculum. Um, so I did have some very good uh, teachers, particularly in high school. I really want to credit my, my math and English instructors in those days. I think my math physics instructor kind of punctured my arrogance bubble. You know, you're in town, you don't really have a, a good comparison to where you are. He really sort of said, you know, dude, you're good at math, but you're going to have to work if you're really going to do any of this. So, um, so I think that was that was helpful. And also, I think I really disliked writing when I was uh, certainly early on in high school. But I had an, an English teacher who really awakened the love of writing and expression in me. And I think uh, again, you know, ultimately, it's part of it's an important part of what we do as statisticians is communication. And um, this is sort of maybe where I sort of started down that that road to getting some skills in that area. So it's a very strong music program I was really involved in. You can see some of the pictures. I actually was a halfway decent trumpet player. Was a lead trumpet by my senior year in high school. Uh, we actually won a state trophy in our class for small schools. Uh, if you heard me later on, my students kind of pulled me out of the out of the closet on that, and I you know, no longer play nearly as well as I did in high school, but you just get to hear me make some noise on this thing. If you were here a few years back, pre, uh, pre pandemic. Um, so, this is a kind of a funny picture. I'm being a little silly here. It's a high school photo, high school yearbook photo. Um, but the, the school got a computer, I think this was in 1980, right? It's the first computer in the school, um, you know, first, uh, probably one of the first personal computers in the town. And uh, nobody really wanted to touch it. <laughs> so I think at that point, I was in some class I wasn't too excited about. So I just, I didn't need it. So I just took a study hall and spent my time being the only person basically willing to fiddle with this computer. I learned basic and a few other things on it. So that was kind of fun. Okay. So as Walter mentioned, uh, I was an undergraduate in Chicago in the early 1980s. Um, it's a uh, it's a classic liberal arts school. At the time, it, it, it had a real holder for the Great Books Program. So the Great Books Program was something they instituted back, I think, in the 1930s. And basically, you just read like 200 classic works, and that was your education. Um, you had to be sort of would learn math from Aristotle or new physics from Newton and all that kind of stuff. Just somehow worked because, of course, they they really did have some um, great people come out of there. Um, so it, it kind of been a little more modernized by the time uh, time we got there, but they still had a basically a one year track of science, math, social science, and humanities for everybody. So if you were a math or physics major, you got to take a year of social science and a year of humanities. If you're an English major, you got to take a year of science and a year of math. You know, obviously some some tracking for people's backgrounds, particularly the science and math. Not really much on the social science humanities. Everybody got thrown into that into that pool. So, but it was also really perfect for someone who didn't know what they wanted to specialize in. So I think part of the reason I went there was because the architecture was really impressive. <laughs> but it also, I really liked it because of the fact it was very, um, very sort of open and, 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 um, and non-specialized. And I kind of hated this idea of specialization. So this sort of lifelong thing of sort of keeping doors open was, was really attractive to me. So um, I was a physics major for a term. Um, that uh, was a pretty uh, somewhat brutal experience. I think I went in with a D to the GM and did uh, not so great. So I thought, well, that's not going to work. I'll probably end up like, having to find a class to make up for this class. I failed. 
So I did indeed only get a 40 out of 100. It turned out the median was 14. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I actually had to end the pull it off a B in the class. I still kind of got the message that, you know, maybe uh, maybe they're really searching out this sort of future uh, Richard Feynman's and you know, folks that were big physics students when I was a kid. So I, uh, I kind of pulled back from that. Um, and eventually settled on math. You know, I was sort of halfway there, big part of courses from physics. So I really did enjoy math and, and um, it left me a lot of freedom to take some other courses. So I was taking classes at the Upanishads, Theory of Cognition, Melville, <laughs> sort of all over the place. But my last term, I thought, you know, maybe I should do something a little practical. I'm about to, to graduate here. I don't really have plans to, to go straight to graduate school. So, um, so I took it for the statistics. <laughs> What are the Upanishads? Hmm? What are the Upanishads? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, this is uh, this is the um, uh, sort of the, the uh, uh, religious text for for Hindu. That's okay. Frank Regu apparently is not here. Either. I'm not, and I'm not at a word of it. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So he teaches uh, he teaches the religious class, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I won't stick you with this part. <laughs> so, okay. So, but there were some other things we did there. Um, you know, life in classes could be a little difficult and cold. It's Chicago. Right? So I actually took this picture when it was bleak um, midwinter day. Lake and um, tons of ice under the shore. Kind of see the city down there in the back. So, Chicago's about eight miles from the sort of center. Of the Euro Chicago's eight miles. Of um, so, I mean, there was a student again in Chicago undergrads, um, maybe grad students, I don't know if you have this, but it's a quarter system. Every week has its just name by its number. Um, so, uh, it, uh, you know, if you say something like it's sixth week, everyone knows what that means. <laughs> um, so, it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty intense place. But uh, to kind of balance out the, the schoolwork, I got involved with the school newspaper, the Maroons. I think that's a that's kind of a sarcastic riff on the um, Princeton, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Not sure. <laughs> um, so you know, Chicago is one of those places that likes to say, you know, that Harvard is the you know, Chicago of East, blah blah blah. So, um, so I did. I was a staff writer for a while. I eventually became news editor, and uh, we kind of did a, a lot of work on on obviously school things, but we we're also kind of a local newspaper as well for the Hyde Park neighborhood. So I guess some of the Pictures from the day is a funny little story. So for those of you that, uh, uh, so, well, if anybody's really, <laughs> really old enough to remember this, probably probably not, but um, <laughs> there was a day before the internet, before before really even computers were heavily used in, in organizing courses. And so in order to, um, rather than use a lottery system or a first come first, they, they use a first come first surf uh, system in person. So people would literally camp out for courses Started about 24 hours before um, uh, the, the um, opening of, of, of class uh, class registration uh, for the most popular classes. You basically showed up with your uh, sleeping bag and maybe your <laughs> and uh, and would wait. So one morning, about I never actually did this myself, but I think when I was on the paper, I got up about four in the morning and went down to sort of hang out with people and talk to them about this. Crazy experience. So, so that's no longer done, um, for better or worse. But uh, it was the kind of the kind of thing that we covered. So, uh, something else happened in Chicago is I met uh, a young woman named Amy Lesman. Picture of her here. Um, she's also hiding in the back somewhere. <laughs> so um, we, uh, as I mentioned, this newspaper thing. So she, uh, we actually met at the newspaper. I had sort of learned to develop photos, and uh, she actually came in, and I, I think I found the picture from the newspaper, yeah, a local um, yeah, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> rib, call you call them rib shacks, right? Rips so it's place you would buy uh, uh, barbecue ribs, and uh, it managed to burn itself down. <laughs> and uh, I think she took some pictures of it. It came in. She was I, maybe it was even planning to sell them. I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 But, uh, but anyway, she went to see if we could certainly use them. We did. Uh, and I showed her how to develop. I knew how to develop pictures back in those days. This is, again, times before we had 
a cell phone that would do that for you automatically. So, um, right, so things developed from there in more ways than one. And we ended up getting married in May of 1987. A nice candid photo. And here we are actually on honeymoon in England. Actually, I think it be Scotland. Scotland. Shehalian. Sorry? Shehalian is the band. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Spent a lot of time in Scotland. So, I think I was just abused by the palm trees. So. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's see, college was uh, over. So we ended up, I ended up moving to New England um, and uh, sort of started down in Boston and eventually kept moving north into Maine. So that's what I lived in the uh, Boston area. And uh, we worked for a year at a, a boarding school called Hyde in Bath. And then we are doing cross country skiing in Maine. It doesn't snow all the time up there, but you might not know the pictures I'm gonna show you. <laughs> so, um, okay, so first job, ATT Bell Labs. Walter, I found this on the wood, and this where fun goes to die. So I was a little burned out, uh, it's extremely burned out from academics after after uh, after finishing at UHC. I also felt like I needed to make some money to pay off student loans, which I borrowed that. Like in temporary standards, very much money, or even by standards of time, all that much money, but I did was feel a little stressed about it. So I took a job as a technical writer at a satellite Bell Labs facility. It was attached to a, a large uh, AT&T, old Westinghouse factory, North had over Massachusetts. So I don't know, probably can't see some of these, but these are sort of, there's actually a, a Dilbert cartoon has a, has a character, Tina, the technical writer. Um, so here's Tina doing some of the things that uh, I experienced as also as a technical writer. So, um, so it was, it was kind of an interesting job in some ways. Um, I worked a lot with engineers and computer scientists to try and record and translate their knowledge into a permanent form. Um, it's basically sort of part of the job. It would be sort of an early version of two games you sort of play in everyone's backyard. So you're working on <clears throat> sort of one piece of computer architecture and then there's some sort of hardware issue and you're sort of trying to learn and pick up things along the way. But eventually this, uh, this gig I think was getting a little bit boring. Um, I paid off my loans, we got married, we were looking to do something new. So in 1987, we, uh, we took jobs as um, uh, high school teachers at a boarding school in, in Bath. Um, it kind of focused on uh, a lot of usually wealthy, not entirely children had sort of been kicked out of other schools. It's kind of a high stress experience. <laughs> sort of therapy without therapeutic training. If you read the news uh, about places like, uh, I think, um, Paris Helton's experience in Utah with a uh, boarding school uh, where she was pretty badly abused. We weren't kind of in that league, but we were sort of a little bit, a little too close to that direction. So we kind of got out of there as soon as we could. Uh, I did learn about wrestling. Everyone had to do a sport, coach a sport. And uh, in the fall, I was doing soccer, which I knew a little bit about. Uh, and then in the winter, it was basketball was a new, a little bit about too. However, that was actually a real sport there. They really wanted to like, Win, win games, so I was uh, near that. So, uh, yeah, wrestling team. Sort of everyone who wasn't good at basketball. And um, so it's kind of fun. I actually got really good, in better shape than I've probably ever been in my life or will be again. And uh, I sort of know how to take people down a little bit. <laughs> uh, but I mean, yeah, all, all joking aside, actually is kind of a, a a good sport for life in a lot of ways because one of the kids who was good at it was sort of explaining, look, you sort of learn this one step at a time. Your first goal is to not get pinned in 10 seconds. <laughs> you don't get pinned in 20 seconds. And then as you go through the whole match, you still lose, of course, because you never get pinned. And then one day you win a match <laughs> <laughs> and you know and, and go on from there. So this sort of like, you know, it's it's one step at a time. You're not gonna like do everything in one shot. This is an important part of the thing. So at this point, um, I think Amy really decided on a career in teaching. She was really very excited outside of the sort of uh, context of where we were working. So we moved up to the Bangor area uh, to be near the University of Maine so she could get her certification in public school teaching. I would say I was probably in something of a quarter life crisis at this point. I took a few months off to write and try to sort of figure out next steps in life. I took a number of temporary jobs 
You can work for the Bluebird factory, moving several tons of blueberries a night off a truck so that wrestling works off. Um, I think I eventually got to running scales because I could actually add. <laughs> but again, in seriousness, I, I think you do learn something about what life's like in this country if you don't have money in your family or an education. You know? So I think these kinds of experiences were also kind of important for me. Um, but um, but uh, eventually I did see an opening for a research associate, a survey research firm that had kind of spun off from the University of Maine. There weren't a lot of jobs like this in the area, uh, certainly for somebody um, with a bachelor's degree in math. There also weren't a lot of qualified applicants either. So you know, all languages all, all worked out. Also that stats class, I took my last year in Chicago. If I'm <laughs> and the owner, I think, also hired me in part because of a feature article I'd written for the Maroon. Um, which somehow came this into you know, earthquakes and geology and he just just sort of that really appealed to him and it was his company very very much a one man band there so uh, so again the sort of contingency of luck but I'm also reminded of quote that luck is the residual design I think um, Vera kind of talked about this last uh, last point um, so in order to get lucky you've also got to have everything in place <laughs> sort of the, the last little piece. So I worked there for a number of years. It was kind of really pretty important to my, my career in many ways. I learned to do telephone and mail surveys, general population, specialty populations. Clients were from all over the place. Um, we did market research for oil for heating oil companies, and then we turned around and do control recruiting for medical researchers, including, I don't know if you can see that here, a guy named John Anian, who currently heads uh, IHPI. So that's really a, a small world experience here. He was working in Boston and Harvard. He were, hired us to do this control recruiting. And uh, you know, it's a little, a little acknowledgement down here in this uh, journal of um, New England Journal of Medicine a piece. So, uh, so yeah, so things kind of intersect in strange ways at the time. Um, so we uh, we also took on, we guess probably the most and the biggest thing we took on were the behavioral risk factor surveillance surveys, which whose data I've actually still used today. We actually collected them for Rhode Island, Massachusetts. We did some of the first interviewer specifications for the CDC. They had not prepared these. And uh, Dave was pretty shocked at this. So we went up to like one in the morning <laughs> with, their, uh, with their staff trying to tell our interviewers how to do it, how to deal with, with various questions. So it was a lot of data management, sort of simple statistical analysis. Um, and a lot of on-the-job learning, how to do, for example, construction of sample weights. Um, so, um, uh, but, uh, you know, surveys, there's some still, still in its early years and the foundational manuscripts were, were basically really recent, recent. And, um, so eventually I, I sort of ended up doing lots of proposal writing and management for the company. And, um, so, well, I'll let, let our life there too. Um, Amy was working at this time, teaching seventh and eighth grade English. Uh, we spent a lot of our weekends sort of traveling all around New England. We, uh, we eventually moved to a small town, sort of halfway between our, our jobs, which were about 80 miles apart. Uh, where there were snowmobiles outside our house that could go all the way to Canada. We had a big garden, garden pictures. Um, definitely had snow. It just a little lamppost that's about six or seven feet high. You can see the storm <laughs> where we were at. We also had a really nice time. There's our, our cozy little house with our cat and our wood stove, which we used about three cords of wood near to heat. And so we describe it as a 21st century job with a 19th century lifestyle. So it's kind of nice in some ways. We also brought Alice into the world. Um, my oldest daughter, 1993. The first winter was the coldest in decades. It was sort of post Mount Pinatubo. Um, and the, this temperature dropped by a few degrees that, that year. So you got down to minus 40, the magical number where since Celsius and Fahrenheit don't matter. background is, you know, that's cold. Um, but, you know, and also eventually the snow melted. We take her out into the, into the world there. And she ended up with a degree in environmental science and captain boat rescue missions in college. So, you know, maybe those times in the woods and kind of Okay, so right the main the main action here um i would say it uh, after seven or seven years there i'd really gotten tired of sending data off to what i thought is a is a more interesting analysis 
I also had never really heard of biostatistics until I was in Northeast Research. I thought statistics meant actual science, but actually it's a lot bigger than actual science. So I did get a math equation in. So I also um, sort of looking around and I found this book. It's a later version, not the 1988 <laughs> version. There was a guy here named Jim Lipkowski on certain methodology. So that made me sort of look at the U of M. Eventually, I did look at a bunch of other programs. And almost ended up at UW. I think I might have been classmates with a couple of other contemporaries. I eventually ended up here, but I, but I didn't. Here instead. The excitement when we were doing the GREs. Maybe it reminded me that I left my IDs at home. And so she kindly raced uh, 45 minutes from our house. Newport, Maine to Orno, Maine, where the exam was being given. I actually got to start the exam late, <laughs> but I did okay. And so we were, here's Alice helping my dad <laughs> in the house. Here she is wondering what in the heck she's got into. <laughs> <laughs> she's cute. I think she still wins. <laughs> okay, so. Um, all right, so I think. Um, I really came here planning to just do a master's degree and get out and get back to work. You know, but then we had, we had this kid, new kid. So I had money saved for Amy to kind of stay home while I did the degree. But uh, I, I was fortunately got to, to work as a researcher at GSRA with, with Morton Brown. Um, the first semester was quite challenging. I think we took, uh, 601 is still pretty much the same as it is now. Every two weeks, Rob Strutterman gave us 20 problems. Each one of us took about four hours to do. <laughs> so you can kind of do the math. That's about 40 hours of problems a week. Wow. It might have been so bad if it, you know, it was only class we were taking, but it wasn't. So uh, it was actually so extreme that the, the TA revolted, and they ended up sort of grading a, a random sample of 10. Because, uh, <laughs> so. Nonetheless, I got really entranced for the subject, and I think I did well enough for some of the faculty to suggest that I apply for the PhD. And I had this interest in survey statistics, and Rod, I think, talks at some point, knew I was considering the PhD, and so I just, you know, as a student. Um, so I did a few things uh, besides uh, besides uh, doing the thesis. I had to work uh, uh, on a training grant with David Williams at ISR. That, uh, that kind of gave me some introduction to causal inference issues, things like positivity, because a lot of this was sort of focused around race, race, uh, racism effects. So uh, it's, a, it's a fact that uh, there are no whites that are really as deprived as, as some blacks are in the United States in terms of economic issues, and certainly 1970s, 1980s data. So, um, so this issue of like, how do you compare us, right? Or when you can't. Um, then I ended up uh, working at uh, UM Transportation Research Institute with Gene Chope and Pat Waller. Um, and uh, I think that was a really important part of my life, getting a bit more luck here. Um, so I uh, had some really interesting, dealing with some really exceptionally complicated data sets, sort of an introduction to some administrative record issues and more generally big data issues, I'm sort of trying to take data from the Michigan Secretary of State's office, which was not designed for research, um, and convert it into something that we could use to, to link up crash and ticket records with uh, middle and high school surveys to kind of see how kids did uh, in terms of their driving records based on sort of the behaviors and attitudes that expressed uh, before they started driving. Um, so my thesis ended up being somewhat disjointed. <laughs> my, my own sort of personal title was driven related topics and observational data. <laughs> but, uh, but they were all fun. And um, you know, they still have continue to have echoes in today's work. I did this work on improving efficiency and probability surveys, sort of using random subsampling. Um, when you sort of get more, if you're sort of changing costs along the way, you get into more expensive components of the designs. You want to say the sample, and that's only work with a, with a group of them. And that's sort of developed as sort of adaptive and, and responsive uh, survey design data that I've been doing. Um, so this uh, estimating census undercount was basically sort of a sampling resampling problem. Where you go and talk to individuals and try to figure out if they were captured in the original census or if they've been captured in the following. Both, and that you sort of estimate either of those things different. Um, approaches using demographic data and kind of bringing some outside information. 
So I've been doing some work with uh, respondent driven sampling with population estimation and this kind of thing, the same thing. And finally, um, sort of accounting for any probability of inclusion and in survey using models, definitely sort of Bayesian methods and surveys that I've, I've followed through my career. So also, um, so I, I really ended up taking a lot of classes. I think Rod at one point told me to stop taking classes. <laughs> 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 We stopped taking classes. It's good advice. Um, another has a really great manners or Rod, which is obviously a, a very, very important one. But uh, Mort, again, was sort of the first, uh, my first uh, RA work, um, sort of helped me sort of sort out some things there. Uh, Trevor Rag and Nathan, um, I've obviously worked with many years, uh, both before and after. Great, great, amazing, um, uh, brilliant, and incredibly positive and, and kind person to work with. I also want to mention somebody, uh, unfortunately now passed away quite a few years back, Pat Waller. Um, she was at, at, uh, at Elm Street, and um, she um, she really sort of helped me learn how to be a good collaborator, and more, more generally a good researcher in many ways. Um, she was uh, really one of the few women in, in academics. Uh, she sort of dated back, uh, really back, sort of started her career in the 1950s. Women doing research in transportation was not a common thing back then. Uh, she even learned how to drive a semi, which she sort of talked about in the 1950s, which was unusual. But sort of the, the sort of issues of sort of trying to learn how to really get into the science of what you're doing and sort of bring your skill set to fill in the piece that needs to be done. And working on a team, um, again, you see sort of the theme of this collaboration and teamwork, um, is sort of the things that she, she helped explain. I think also I want to point out some of my fellow students that were really, really great to work with. So these are some of the People here, Jason Roy is currently, uh, many of them are, are chairs now. Jason is this chair at, uh, at Rutgers. Um, Arvin Jane uh, works with the World Bank. Um, Julie Douglas uh, was here for many years in Michigan, now at Skidmore. She's also a chair. Leslie McClure, chair at, um, at Drexel and Sherry Messenger. I think maybe Sherry was certainly a faculty member down at the University of Miami. So uh, really great people to learn with. A lot of memories of nights in the basement or Empty classrooms, going up and working on the board, trying to solve these problems. Uh, you know, fifty cent machine coffee. You know, used to be coming down there and uh, kind of crank through the nights and things. So, um, Caroline joined us in, in 1996, third semester of my master's program. Here's Alice wondering again what she's gotten into. Uh, <laughs> and sister, uh, excited and terrified at the same time, just like we were as parents. Um, she was kind of born on a Friday evening, so <laughs> so I was actually uh, you know kind of in the middle of, of the semester there trying to balance parenthood and Amy uh, was was uh, was obviously sort of critical here. Um, she went back to work, however, um, to teach in Belleville uh, High School at Romulus uh, Alternative High School, um, in part to get her career back on track, and also because um, you know by then we kind of used up our savings. Uh, so I was also at a stage where I could be home or at least flexible with my time a little bit more. So, so that was uh, in some ways a really great, good time and a really great time to be a, a young parent and living in family housing where she mentioned was also a really great place to be. We really were in the same boat. It really was a bit of a village raises the child, sometimes quite literally when somebody's gone missing and you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so help out, you know, sort of kept an eye on things. There's a, um, it was very nice. You're sort of you're away from the road, so you, the kids can kind of be out and moving around and just a little more freedom at a young age. And here they are running around in the summertime. So Halloween, Halloween was quite crazy, as you can imagine. All the little kids. Again, this is Michigan, so um, we have our big snows once in a while. So it was it was a good experience. All right, so we got done with that. So I guess it's now 2000. Uh, I did about 10 interviews while trying to teach a couple of classes. Uh, UM Post Defense was a little crazy. I felt like I didn't even have a t shirt in the different places I went to that winter and spring. And eventually ended up at, um, at the Department of um, Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Now, uh, EBEI, they've added in um, bioinformatics. So, informatics. Sorry, I changed the informatics. Um, so here's uh, some stock shots of Philly. Um, this was kind of a view from here where the campus was, kind of across the uh, Schuylkill River, 
So you have to be in Philadelphia to pronounce Google. So pronounce what everyone else would call the skull killing. It's called skull killing. Um, so, um, so I think uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, so some of the work there when I did back at Umtree kind of connected to what I eventually developed into a sort of an injury research portfolio. Um, did a lot of great work with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with a seven-year perspective study of children and passenger vehicle crashes. So um, a lot of this was sort of investigating safety enhancements of car seats and vehicle features. So they did a lot of, they also were very connected in with, um, with the uh, legislative system. So a lot of our research would be put in front of state governments to suggest the car seat rules and, and car seat regulation. Uh, this is still, I think, my most cited paper, which is a journal, JAMA paper, Journal of American Medical Association paper, that showed uh, sort of these smaller uh, compact extended cab pickup trucks back in the early 2000s, which were very popular, actually quite risky for children. Um, so, um, um, so along with that, I also did some work at the Wharton School of Business with a fellow named Paul Kleindorfer, who was sort of one of the world's leading experts in risk management. And um, he had access to a five-year census of chemical releases at about 15,000 U.S. facilities, investigated risk factors for chemical releases inside of toxic chemicals, did some work in this environmental justice idea, sort of trying to look at the siting of these facilities relative to the types of communities they were in. Um, also became a bit of a, uh, after 2001 and the World Trade Center attacks, became a bit of a um, hot potato, I guess, for lack of a better word. They, um, government got very nervous about the information, although honestly, with the, uh, now with the internet, <laughs> or even just a, a car driving around, you could find these facilities that weren't, weren't hidden. But, uh, but we sort of got had to like dial back on that because it's about, you know, Potential information releases. Um, and one of the last major things I worked on was a case control study of gun violence in Philadelphia with Charlie Brannis and Doug Weed, who's now here to hit the injury center just recently, this fall. Um, so this was ostensibly, and it was actually the study of the uh, the risk of of sort of the establishment selling liquor on, on gun violence. You see that was our paper there, but but uh, we also sort of snuck in the risk of owning a gun and gun-related injury. So some of the, the background on this is uh, NIH had, had a ban on gun-related research. It was a, kind of an overreaction, I think, to the laws that were passed uh, in the 1990s about uh, sort of trying to block the federal government from being involved in, um, in studies related to, um, uh, well, not studies, but to, to block uh, they're not saying the actual research, but it was to, to, to block funding for gun control, basically. But NIH interpreted this in the most extremely conservative way they could. So it was basically almost impossible until very recently to, to get funding mm -hmm. for this kind of work. So Charlie managed to get it. So um, in terms of uh, the more sort of methodological side of my life, I um, really started to get involved in learning about causal inference with uh, some of the real leaders in the field that, that would get some, a chance kind of assembled there. Um, so also because I've done most work in survey statistics, I was able to sort of link this together with, with some of the same concepts of, um, uh, because they, they, they tended to over, overlap and borrow a lot from each other. I didn't really understand that at first, but eventually just came to understand that we're really talking about the same thing. We're just moving the structure of the missing data from the population to the treatment arm. So we have these unknown counterfactuals that are, that are missing data, uh, just as we have the same issue in, in the survey setting. And so a lot of the same methods can sort of be brought together or, or certainly adapted to these problems. Um, so I also got interested in this idea of the variability of variance in individuals. I had some uh, plot from some of these uh, measures of, of uh, sort of short-term um, uh, attitudes towards um, um, sort of positive and negative aspect, like were you feeling good or bad that day? And um, uh, there's sort of, uh, these were in, in sort of post-heart uh, post attack, like heart and abortion patients. 
and sort of looking across the, the, the subject, you can see quite a bit of variability. Some subjects were in the very itself, some subjects were very stable, some were kind of all over the place. Uh, so this idea of sort of trying to look at that, we did find actually a fair amount of relationship, even a small sample, between this variability and, and, and some of the depression measures of outcome that we're looking at. So, so that sort of picked up another and um, you know our life here. We we lived in, in Wallingford, next to Swarthmore, sort of southwest of Philadelphia. Um, we took the train in to work most of the time. It really kept in my journals as good as I did then when I had that automatic twenty or thirty minutes of, of dead time where I could just sit and, and pop open a journal and read. Um, Alice and Caroline started school. Uh, Amy went back uh, to a place called Widener College, down the road from us. Did a master's degree in education, where she took on a job as a reading specialist. Um, Philadelphia is a very historical city. A lot of um, you know, Constitution, um, the Congress were there. It's also halfway between New York and DC, Atlantic Beaches. So we invited the third family um, uh, on the beach there. So then um, back to Ann Arbor, 2004, Jeremy Taylor called to let me know the Department of Biostat was going to hire junior faculty. I don't know if you remember that. Sorry, that's fine. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so I interviewed, was so offered the position, returned in September 2005, and here, of course, today. This was also I ended up being joint with the survey methodology program and the Institute for Social Research. So I'm sort of Half the time over here, you can see us, and then over at ISR. We were delighted to have him back, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, why did we come back? I mean, we really enjoyed living in Philadelphia. It was a good department. I had some great collaborations there. But there were a few things that were going on. One, one is I didn't really want to be the lone survey statistician. I was sort of in this hallway. So, as people would sort of wander down, they sort of, like, Going down the funnel trying to find somebody who knew something about surveys and <laughs> in my office. And, and um, so it was kind of fun in some ways, it was also pretty stressful. And it wasn't necessarily a great way to be, be organizing a research career. Um, I also really, uh, we were, the student program there was very thin and new. And of course, it's a little larger, more established program here. And I was also starting to learn that you know students could really be plus in your, in your life. So I kind of worked with students here, it was a big part of my. I wanted to come here and, and finally kind of wanted a bigger challenge. I mean, I never feel like the smartest or most skilled person at the table, but you're usually. And so I'm always learning new things. I never get bored. And even Penn, I felt a little bit like I was getting into a bit of a rut. And I felt like coming here, maybe I'd avoid that forever. And it really has been the case. And I think the last thing, I feel a little bit guilty about this because many faculty here, your parents are across the ocean, your family's across the ocean. For me, Actually, we're near near here. I mean, I can get down to them two and a half hours versus sort of eight hours by plane and car. You know, they're just little farm. So even with a airline, I've got to like, you know, it's a long drive. And finally, um, Caroline in particular was getting involved in, in music. And sort of, she had to chase her away from the guitar when she was four years old. We <laughs> actually realized that she was fascinated with this. And so she started doing viola when she was in kindergarten. Um, and uh, so the music programs here were pretty attractive. As well. Okay, so you know I've continued to have a chance to work with Rod and, and Ragu and, and others on survey statistics and missing data. Um, I'm particularly gotten involved with uh, combining sort of probability and non-probability samples in, in recent years. Um, I've done uh, collaboration with Jeremy Taylor and surrogate markers and causal inference, um, and. Um, Sort of working this idea that you know a good surrogate is sort of part of the causal pathway between a, a treatment or a set of outcomes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, variance as a predictor in longitudinal settings, uh, work with Funky Wu. Um, so, sort of flipping around now, having some more junior people, more, you know, more senior. Um, and sort of working this idea of evidence of system breakdowns it might be a more sensitive predictor of, of, of changes and risks than, than mean by, them, by themselves. And finally, doing some work in uh, capture, recapture, measurement error settings with, with pre exceptions. That's some really cool work there. Over at ISR, um, we're working on responsive and adaptive designs with uh, Brady West and James Wagner. The idea here being basically sort of an optimization problem. You're sort of trying to minimize costs for a fixed amount of information. 
or maybe minimize uh, or maximize information for fixed costs. Also, incorporating prior information via, Bay via Bayesian methods. I guess I learned the other day streaming data. So we're doing streaming data. So, um, but basically, sort of trying to use this idea of Bayes is very natural flavor for this, where you can actually sort of think about the prior data, earlier data forming sort of basis to form priors and so forth. So, um, also more recently, started working with responded driven sampling with uh, Sung Yi Lee. Then sort of a, an initiating approach where you do a, sort of a variant this idea of snowball sampling. You start with seeds, typically non-random, that uh, recruit people in a population to know. The people they recruit then recruit other people. This goes on and on. And it turns out that fixing the number recruited and tracking the number known can lead to a probability sample under a whole ton of <laughs> fairly restrictive uh, assumptions. So we've been sort of exploring what happens when those assumptions fail as well as doing work on power calculations, uh, population size estimates, network size reports, which are important. So, um, so that's some great stuff there. So some of the collaborations um, sort of continue to work with uh, this, this sort of transportation research area um, with, with Carol Flanagan. Um, uh, again, this sort of tied back to some issues of probability and non-probability sampling, combining those. Um, I've had a chance to work on uh, cohort studies with Nigel Paneth and Kerber. Um, sort of started out in a national children's study, which uh, honestly, if uh, I think if I had uh, been earlier in my career, I'd have actually sunk it because it it turned out to to basically founder on sort of the big science model. Too many uh, too many people trying to do too many different things, um, but it kind of came back with uh, this thing called Echo. If you think of Echo, the NCS. And it's been very neat. We've been able to produce a probability sample of a thousand Michigan births by using uh, a novel idea using uh, birth certificate records to develop a sampling frame and sampling design. So, also as part of this, I kind of did some work um, developing um, a way to kind of create uh, equal size uh, sampling clusters with controlled uh, similarities or dissimilarities of characteristics. So, I kind of broke up Kent County or Grand Rapids. Is into uh, 10 different uh, groups that are uh, sort of uh, most similar on a bunch of socioeconomic uh, uh, statuses, and they're also contiguous and, and compact. So I actually tried to, <laughs> tried to, when Michigan was trying to do something similar with the, the creating congressional districts, actually reached out to them and they weren't interested. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we need a chance to work on social media. We want to do problems. So really a bunch of very cool things. Uh, oh, also I don't want to discount the work I do with uh, women's midlife uh, health with Siobhan Harlow and Kerry um, Carbonon Gutierrez, uh, looking at things like predictions of menopause onset, trajectories of symptom clusters. Also recently gotten through quite a work on smoking cessation with Nashi Fleischer. So some of the collaborations, I think, as a biostatistician, you know, many of my collaborations lead to methods and they go back into the collaboration cycle. Um, so when I was at Children's Hospital, uh, a lot of these uh, samples were quite extreme uh, probability sample designs so of very large weights, which became excellent test beds for accounting for unequal probability selection via modeling and smoothing. Um, collaborations at Untree have involved working with non-probability samples, This kind of builds on previous work with uh, with NCI, um, improving inference by combining data probability samples of different quality. And, um, and then women's health, that sort of gets into this uh, variance as a predictor of health. Um, issues using um, hormone profiles to look at uh, things like hot flash risks. And none of these problems had off the shelf answers and they all, um, they all led to novel application development. And I think deeper considerations of methodological issues. So um, we even wrote a paper on this going back to my days at Penn, a fellow named Nicholas uh, Stetler. We designed a study of obesity in children, low-income health clinics, which led to a, a model for a, a, a method for doing transcription errors via a mixture model, sort of accounted for the uncertainty and outlier detection. So as well as the possibility that some of these transcription errors were not outliers, but they were still errors that should be taken out. So um, <clears throat> I think, um, Nick did a really good job of talking about our, our collaboration. Uh, that uh, it's easy for clinical scientists to kind of focus on clinical outcomes, uh, and for statisticians to maybe be speaking a different language, just 
regarding design and location, which are important, but maybe not considering the clinical issues. But it's really important for each, each of the collaborators to kind of learn a little about the other area. So I learned about child growth, obesity, pediatric health care. He learned about complex sampling, more limitation, outliers. Neither of us became an expert in the field, but we, we learned enough to, to speak with each other. And um, you know, this recognition of the transcription errors, which is the reality of the part of the study where what created this need for novel statistical methods. And at the same time, by differentiating these, differentiating these transcription errors from the outliers, uh, real outliers, we can be confident about our about our assumptions. So, um, <clears throat> so I think this was uh, some of that. And you all the way through this, I still have been involved in the University of Pennsylvania. When I moved here, I think a uh, colleague said, you know, you don't really leave, you just sort of collect new ones along the way. <laughs> and after 22 years, I still continue to collaborate with Ford. Uh, most recent work has been a cool study involving a driving simulator, the time of licensing for about 17,000 newly licensed Ohio drivers. We do a large set of variables related to the driving behavior, which we've used to sort of classify four major types and 20 subtypes using a combination of, of um, pencil strategy, of, um, principal components and clustering methods. And uh, it's turned out to, be, to have some success in predicting uh, whether or not they got licensed and even right for risk after 30 minutes, 30 minutes of following. So getting near the end here, I wanted to kind of say a little bit about grad students. I really had an incredible good fortune to advise and co-advise um, almost 30 students in my career. And I, and I think together we're four multipliers. I may provide the seed of an idea, but they're really responsible for growing it into something beautiful and useful. And they learn along the way when they do that, but I'm I often am too. I'm often just sort of trying to keep up with their students are reading or doing. And you can see, um, you know, I've had uh, about five folks have gone into academics, uh, four have gone into government, uh, got 12 uh, that are basically in private industry, and, and one who's a doctor. I just point out uh, kind of common to advise you. Jeremy is actually just finishing her residency. And um, also really had some important research associates, staff statistician, director of scientists. I'll just mention four here, uh, Yang Wang and, and Michael Callan at the University of Pennsylvania. Really kind of kick off my career. Um, Yang did a, a lot of work helping me to organize this incredibly complex um, chemical release data. And, and Michael was critical for the DCS study at CHOP. Um, and Rena's done a lot of I've done work on all kinds of things with her here. Mostly the biggest one probably was the swan and the, and the midlife, wins midlife, and the shell quit also. Um, and finally, just a little bit about service. I think, um, you know, taking the chance to get certain organized sessions at conferences or even organized conferences is really valuable. Uh, reviewing uh, papers and grants is, is a really great way to sort of keep up with, with current work. Um, and also, to, if you get a chance to serve on, on NIH community, NIH. Uh, you can, even if they're not in statistics, I think it's, it's really valuable. I found a lot very helpful to learn about the sort of general process of how grants are, are funded. Um, and finally, um, uh, I think it's, as Peter mentioned, that we served as associate chairs. I was in academic affairs, um, uh, which included the pandemic period. It was extremely exhausting. I just checked today. I have 713 saved emails in my associate chair file. <laughs> it was also extremely rewarding. So. It's, Working with um, and here the credit really goes to, to Ramar who, who instituted many of these ideas. I was just sort of trying to, to make them happen. But we organized this uh, camp store for incoming students, created the student navigator position, uh, sort of regenerated uh, student faculty lunch and dinners. We had teaching workshops. When the pandemic hit. We hit. We helped develop all my student groups and really sort of dealt with the whole issues time. And so I want to just finish up a little pitch for life in academics. I think I had some students recently who have been been like, I know if I want to do this, you know, it just seems like a it's a real grind, you know, being a being a professor, you know, always working, and you know, it doesn't seem like a really happy place. But I have to say, I I have just been really really happy I made this choice. You know, I think you have control and freedom in your career and life in a way that's hard to replicate in other professions. It's also a bit of security, you know. Maybe I'm summoning the demon here, but, but hopefully you are much I assume so that sort of you know there's no radical changes in your in your mission. Your mission sort of sets. <laughs> also travel. I mean, I don't know. You can sort of view this either way. Maybe if you don't like travel, maybe this is a, a downside. But I, I like it. Sort of the countries I've been able to go is 
on the job, so to speak, for various conferences. You can see um, <clears throat> uh, there's a some global outreach to, to East Africa. So here's actually, I think it's hard to see. Maybe there's Kelly and, and Gary, um, <clears throat> two other people in our our dean. I think it's hiding here somewhere. We are in Ethiopia, uh, uh, working with uh, uh, some training there. Uh, this is uh, in Paris at a uh, bar that had a Michigan uh, flag and <laughs> the Big Ten flag, so that's kind of unusual. I've done sabbaticals a couple times in in um, in uh, in London, sort of when the kids were a little younger, and then more recently, we were in Utah, trips to China, and so forth. So, so, you know, life has continued on. Uh, Amy worked as a reading teacher at St. Thomas the Apostle, eventually fired for not being Catholic. So that's another story. <laughs> uh, she's run her own tutoring business since then. So again, you know, your blessing in disguise. She's mm -hmm. returning to her art interests. She does a lot of pottery. She's Rita Podrenko. If you had a chance to see her work, well, maybe it's not in the same class as Rita, because Rita is amazing. She's doing some cool stuff. You know, sugar bowl for the house and some drawings. Um, Alice graduated from Unity High School in 2011 and entered college in 2015, where she, amongst other things, uh, helped do our rescue uh, operation out there. She is on the, on the boat, uh, exploiting all kinds of amazing stuff, I think. Uh, now she lives in Ypsilanti. And, uh, she's doing uh, music as a bass. And uh, Caroline uh, graduated from Huron High School in 2014. Uh, and Edinburgh. So that, uh, that trip, that, uh, that 2012 uh, thing I did uh, going to England on sabbatical turned out so she actually went over there, met a guy, fell in love with the country as well as a person, and now is finishing her PhD in musicology at Royal Holloway, University of London, I live in Oxford. And our dogs, there's Zach the Black, passed away for 14 wonderful years, that's here. Now we have Bert. Was a Jack Russell Terrier, maybe also a bat. I can't tell. <laughs> Just joined us in life. And anyway, so we're extremely fortunate. You know, we live in Ann Arbor. Here's our good friends, uh, Dan and Deborah, um, Ward Hills area, you know, kayaking, goofy. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, also is doing the bee thing. So bee <laughs> thing really great. So, anyway, we're really fortunate and blessed in this life. And I'm glad I've had a chance to sort of, you know, give a little, little bit of background on that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Was such a rich and inspiring journey, and to, to share with us. And uh, based on what I heard, that I think that we uh, will give uh, Amy a round of applause for her support. <laughs> I'm moving with you everywhere in the country and, you know, to support your career and support family. I know that Eddie is tired of moving to another place, so you will stay here at another until retirement. So, well, a very um, sort of uh, delight to know that you choose off this as your destination for your career, at the, so you find the right sort of discipline to do research and you know training everything. Uh, I, I think that's uh, Fausta is very good uh, career for us and for you and for everyone here. So. So uh, we have a certificate and I appreciate your uh, contribution to this journey talk and maybe we should take a photo and oh, that would be 1,070 <laughs> 33 <laughs> emails. <laughs> and hold this too, that's so, yes. So we do have some of your uh, students and trainees who are attending this, uh, okay. you know, Talk and uh, they probably. Uh, I would like to invite them to come from them to share some things that you never, you haven't okay. told us. Yeah, so, uh, so please. Terrifying. I think they are going to say something. And Amy's here. So. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Igbo, uh, one of Mike's PhD students. Uh, actually, I, I, I started working with Mike since the summer of 2020 uh, when the COVID hit. So it was a difficult time. So our activities was transformed online. So 
actually we didn't get a chance to know each other in person at, in the very beginning. Um, so instead, we uh, our meetings are all scheduled online. And but I want to say that even though we only met virtually, and also there was time difference at that time, Michael was in London, but. I want to say, even so, uh, I never felt being left alone. And I know that Mike has always been there, offering his help and the support for me, uh, which is very important to me, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and finally, this year, I'm really glad that we can meet in person. And of course, we have this journey lecture, uh, which makes me know more about Mike. <laughs> and, and actually, I do have one thing to add to share this fun observation about Mike from my perspective. So uh, I don't know whether my class already been aware of this, but I bet that at least most of the students, uh, we notice that when Mike starts thinking, sometimes he will unconsciously close his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> So um, well, every time when Mike does so, I just wish I had the magic to get into his head to see if this brilliant idea got shift. <laughs> and all in all, I want to say that I'm so lucky and really appreciate to have Mike as my mentor. Thank you. Oh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I wasn't really sure how long this will be. So. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm Irina, and I've been working with Mike, I think, for about three years now. Um, and I also had, I think, for most of the time we worked together, it has been over Zoom because we had COVID the first year, and then Mike was on sabbatical the next year. So I'm very happy to be working with him in person. Um, not only is Mike very smart and very knowledgeable about biostatistics, he's also a great person and always very encouraging, which I think is equally encouraging important when looking for a research advisor and also collaborator. Um, he has encouraged me to apply for many fellowships and awards that I personally did not think that I was qualified to do, but he told me to go for them anyway. Um, most of the time they didn't pan out, but I think um, the, the process of working together on that was very valuable. Um, also, I guess uh, I'll just share the story of, I think, our first conversation <laughs> we ever had. So this was pre-pandemic, and I was, I think, a first-year student, very new to the department, so professors were kind of like scary, magical creatures. Um, and so we were on a hike, I think, organized by Ron, and I was walking with Mike, and I didn't know what to say, so I just asked him about his hobbies, and that's how I learned that he was a beekeeper. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of, I guess, like my first uh, my first experience seeing like, oh, he's he's a professor, but he's also a human. <laughs> if I ever run out of things to say, I can always ask him about his <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Uh, so thank you for sharing your journey with us and allowing us to learn more about you. Um, so my name is Mia and I'm a first year PhD student. So I only work with Mike since this May. So it's kind of um, only half a year of working with Mike, but uh, uh, unlike the bio students, I spend most of time with Mike in person. And I think um, he's very responsive and helpful when I need anything. He would like kind of sending uh, different kind of resources to me. And um, I think that um, the thing that makes me pretty surprised is that um, uh, so before I choose him as advisor, he is the one who reaching out to me instead of I reaching out to him to see whether um, he would like to be my advisor. So I'm kind of uh, surprised that um, he was pretty patient uh, waiting for my responses. So I think I still have a long time working with Mike. So that would be, I would expect that to be a pretty um, good time working with him. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, do you want to make some? Uh, yeah. No, I would just say that actually, really, really appreciate the, the comments. And it, it, it's, you know, you guys are very representative of, of the great students I've had a chance to work with over these, over these past years. And, it's really one of the, again, one of the really cool things about academics that's hard to replicate other places is this ability to 
they have such such great students and, and they sort of the excitement that they really bring and the, and the creativity they bring and the sort of fresh ideas they, they bring to the, the research experience is, is really cool. So. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, so we're moving to a more terrifying part of this uh, <laughs> meeting as I'm open floor for my colleagues and uh, <laughs> your, uh, collaborators to make comments. I would first invite Amy <laughs> to make some comments because Amy is part of the Bowser family. She participates a lot of the, the department uh, activities, events that maybe you want. No, I don't think no. so. <laughs> <laughs> Next person, oh, what? Oh, I said, I saw Rob, they have some comments and, and some fun uh, stories to share with us. And, uh, I wonder if anybody want to say something. I just want to say that uh, Mike brought me into STATCOM, and one of the things that I that I that I think that's really important is that I think that 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 just really shows. I mean, he is such a busy guy, and this just this commitment to students and to helping them um, go along in this journey about learning how to be. A good collaborator. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Mike, for that opportunity. That's for me as a research professor. I don't get to teach our students, but this is a great way of like really being, you know, tied into that. And then also like sharing your home and inviting inviting Jim and me to your house. It just made me really feel part of the U of M family. So thank you to both of you. It has been a really important part of, of, of my you know, life here too, and not, not recent years, not too much, but um, but I have to give credit to Ramar and also Rod, who basically Ramar, even when she mentioned his name, Ramar was like, hey, start one of these here. Right? I think I was a second year in my year. And so it's like, sure, why not? <laughs> and uh, it's been really great. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been a wonderful chance to, to get students involved in you know, times of um, uh, well, I, I'll just say that I was walking from ISR back to main campus uh, one time a few years ago, and you happened to be walking the same way. You were ahead of me, I think. And I ran up because I had a question for Mike. <laughs> that, you know, like the next 15 minutes chatting. And I was so appreciative at the end of that. It's like, so if you ever have a question, follow Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Catch him. Uh, he will answer your, I mean, I'm making this up, but I'm assuming he did. He based on past. You know, <laughs> but it sounds in the past. Um, he's a great guy. He will help you. <laughs> Very much, my sure. Jeremy, do you still remember the call you made to uh, <laughs> yes. 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 come back to me? Yes. 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 <laughs> something where maybe it wasn't you. <laughs> I do vaguely remember. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember the weekly the one was the conversation about? <laughs> well, we had a job opening. Right, right. right. As, a, as a student, when, when I first came here, persuasive. Uh, I remember to, uh, back and back. I remember running into a, a pool full of pool with his tiny, tiny baby and Amy. Right. <laughs> so strong gosh. Uh, that was like 1998. <laughs> I also want to okay. Um, just a quick follow-up on Brenda's point. I think Mike is not only a great guy to discuss questions, and he's always very mindful and caring about the junior faculty members. And it's actually Mike, you actually connect me with Felix, and we work on some projects, and that lead me to this area with, you know, the cultural inference in social research. And, you know, for like maybe our some of our junior colleagues, including me, when we have our CV ready for the promotion package, for the interim check, now, after three years, Mike has always been there Say, hey, do you need help? And I would be very happy to read. And I think that is very, very helpful for all the new faculty members. And as you guys can see, he is also very active in the department and leading many of those activities. And that makes, you know, kind of getting this department on the right way, on the track, everything. Thank you so 
Jacob. Um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, as a junior faculty uh, who is growing the department, I think senior faculty is very important uh, in modeling the, you know, how to do things, how to manage projects, especially complicated projects. So during the pandemic, I believe it's in 2020, um, uh, Mike generously reached out to me, getting involved in the project of uh, using longitudinal data and to derive the variance of longitudinal data as predictor for outcome. I think that experience has been extremely good and I have uh, mentored, continued to mentor a few students jointly with Mike. And I think I'm pretty much the observer to see how Mike is conducting the you know, management side of things. Of course, the technical things, I don't, don't need to say more. And I think that gives them all a sense of how to run things efficiently. Um, uh, I think Mike can, tends to speak things very efficiently and to the point. And I think that as a nat uh, non-native speaker, and that's a lot to learn, and uh, it's a great resource to learn how to communicate. And I um, also want to say that I have the habit of sending out random articles that I like to uh, maybe a subset of faculty. And uh, Mike is always a person who writes clearly thoughtful emails uh, in reply. Probably the only one or two. Uh, so I always, uh, I always appreciate those uh, responses. And um, that made me very comfortable of uh, asking questions, like some technical questions I encounter in the paper, or I have a paper submitted I was sent to Mike, and Mike would be very supportive and uh, saying it's a good paper, and I think it means a lot to me. The final thing is that uh, uh, Mike and Amy uh, were very active in cycling, I think at least during pandemic or before pandemic. So uh, I think one of their familiar routes is uh, near the Leslie Golf Course, because I used to live there and uh, I run a lot. And one day I, I ran through that uh, path and I saw, hey, you know, I think I know these two people. <laughs> you guys cycle very fast. And I think that speaks to the, you know, uh, the, I believe the kind of, you know, the relationship and also the kind of work and life balance you're modeling for for your kids and I think that's a very good thing to see although you did not know probably at the time <laughs> thanks anybody else want to make their comments or share their stories and for the interest of time that I thank you all for coming uh, I hope that you enjoy this journey talk and I just want to repeat my opening remark. Uh, the reason that this department is so attractive is that we have wonderful colleagues like Mike who make the department a very warm, welcoming place to work so that we uh, enjoy uh, being his colleague. And Say one thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one, only thing I wanted to say, Mike, was that you and I both really enjoy having students over. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, you know, you shared with me is that I, I used to stress that our house wasn't fancy enough because it's not something that's a priority for us. We like to bike, we like to travel, but we don't have a fancy house. And the important thing that we realized that it was that we have a fire in the fireplace, we have chairs to sit on, we have a comfortable place. Because the thing we like to do is to sit back and talk to people and relax and ask you guys, you know, how is it really going? You know, what's really stressing you out? And have you seen your folks recently? Have you been in touch with people? How are you doing? And, and that's kind of, and, and Mike's kind of been helpful, helping me not to stress about it because it used to really stress me out. And now I relax when you guys come over. It doesn't, I don't worry about it. So he's kind of taking the lead, helping me feel comfortable with all that. So, because we really love having you guys over. It's really fun. No, we're post pandemic. Yeah, we'll try to do more of it. Right. Also, the, the only food from Indiana I can think of oh, yeah. is sugar cream pie. <laughs> Not very healthy, but it is much. Uh, we're spending time here, and, and I will see you on Sunday. We'll have a holiday party. Yeah. And certainly, I hope you enjoy this uh, very rich, inspiring uh, journey. Thank you, Mike.